Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning, the scripture text is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 11. And this is what it says. Now, it came about that while the multitude were pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Genesaret. And he saw the boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the multitudes from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but at your bidding I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For amazement had seized him and his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon, and Jesus said to Simon, do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. Let us pray. Lord, it's your day, it's your time. We call it worship, but we know that something bigger than that word is going on here. And may that something, Jesus, may that something be you that you begin to transform us in this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Years ago, my son and I went riding motorcycles at an off-road motorcycle park. Over a thousand acres, six motocross tracks. We were unloading our trailer when I noticed the couple of guys trying to start a motorcycle that was just like my son's bike. And I just you know, mention a word or two that helped me start my sons. And the guys kind of looked up at me and went back to doing what they were doing, trying to start this, this dirt bike. And we unloaded, rode that day. And it wasn't until later on that afternoon that um, I learned that the fellow that I was giving mechanic advice to was chief mechanic for Team Honda's Baja 1000 championship racing team. And the thought of me giving mechanical advice to this fellow that was uh, chief mechanic for Team Honda is sort of like me giving pitching advice to John Smoltz. It's a little bit, it's, it's, it's a little bit like me giving batting advice to Hank Aaron. Or if you think, me giving mechanical advice to a, a, a chief mechanic of Team Honda is sort of like well, it's a lot like Jesus giving fishing advice to Simon Peter. And that's what's going on here. Jesus was from Nazareth. 
the closest body of water, he might have eaten fish at some point in his life, but the closest body of water was more than 15 miles away. And the chances of him fishing ever in his life were pretty slim. He was a carpenter. Carpenters didn't fish for a living, nor do they now. And he was a carpenter turned preacher, which didn't increase his ability to fish and to advise others on how to fish. Peter, on the other hand, had been fishing his whole life. He did it for a living. And chances are pretty good that he learned from his father who'd been doing it all his life, who learned from his father who'd been doing it all his life, and every fisherman on the Sea of Galilee knew this is how you fish. You fish at night. That's when the water's cool and the fish come to the surface and you have a chance at catching them in a net. When the sun comes up, you wash your nets because you've got just about zero catch chance of catching any fish. They go to the shallows. They hide. Well, here, Simon Peter and the other fishermen, they're, they're washing their nets. They'd been fishing all night, hadn't caught a thing, and Jesus is teaching. And then at the end of his teaching and preaching, he doesn't give an altar call. He doesn't give a challenge. He gives a fishing lesson. He says, cast your nets into the deep water. Now, you can almost hear <laughs> the, the, the despair in Simon Peter's voice. He says, Master, we've been fishing all night and caught nothing, but at your bidding, if you say so, but if you say so. I can't imagine a more half-hearted cast that Simon Peter ever had. I, I imagine that he just kind of flopped the net out there, and in reeling the net in, pulling it in, he was preparing his, I told you so, and then he felt something. Well, it was something that he hadn't felt all night long, that he had something. He could feel something. So then he began to pull it in, and then he began to feel something. He began to feel something as he began to draw his net in, something that he hadn't felt ever in his life. And then as, as that catch of fish hit the surface of the water and the, the white water began to break, he, he began to call his friends, and they began to laugh and high-five and backslap. It was an incredible, so great a catch of fish that it began to, to sink their boats as they put the fish into the boats. And in the middle of all this, a catch that no one had ever seen before, he, that's when Simon Peter comes out, depart. And you know, depart doesn't sound anything like thank you, does it? It doesn't roll off the tongue in the same way. It sounds a whole lot like shoo or go away. And that's what he says. Because Simon Peter knows something that the reader doesn't. This isn't about fishing. That very often we don't know what we're doing when we're doing it. Very often, we don't know what we're doing when we're doing it. That very often, we think we're putting the kids to bed when really what we're doing is we're making a home. We're creating a, a safe space for children to give thanks to God. A safe space for children to, to voice their doubts to God. We don't know what we're doing when we're doing it. Very often, we don't know what we're doing. When, we're, we're doing, when we offer that, that kind word or that encouraging word, we don't know what, what's going on with that other person. And really what we may be doing is offering hope. We don't, we don't know what we're doing when we're doing it. Very often, we think we've set aside a, a little time, a space for worship. But what we're doing is preparing our eyes and our hearts to see Jesus all week long, all life long. We're building a foundation for Jesus Christ. That, that we don't know what we're doing when we're doing it. And right here they're fishing, but you know, it's not about the fishing. It's not about the fishing. And the first thing that I want to talk about is what it is. It is, it is about obeying God in the small stuff. 
And Simon Peter, he was told that something easy, something small, put out your nets and let them down for a catch. Well, that's small. That's real small. And to hear that from someone who knew nothing about fishing, it makes you pause. It makes you pause for a minute. Yeah. If, if he hadn't obeyed God in the small stuff, would he have ever heard the big stuff? The big stuff like, you're Peter and the rock on which I'll build my church. Years ago, when my brother was entering into the, the workforce, he was very young, started in the, <laughs> a, a very entry-level position in a Fortune 500 company. And after a couple of years there, they offered him a slight step up in uh, another department. The department was procurement. He was the bottom man on the totem pole for this Fortune 500 company uh, to procure, to buy things for uh, the, uh, that, that the company needed. Well, the whole family celebrated with my brother and this this slight step up, even though he was bottom man on the totem pole, this was, this was a, a step up for him. And, and I remember my father said, um, he said, remember who you work for. He told my brother, he said, there are going to be some sellers that will offer you things like a, a turkey at Christmas. He said, don't take the small thing. Don't take a, something like a turkey at Christmas. Don't take tickets to a little league baseball game. Don't even take a pen and pencil set, because if you take the little stuff, it's only a matter of time before they start offering you something a little bigger and a little bigger, and then you'll be working for them, not for the company that pays your check. Fast forward a few years later, that Fortune 500 company had an audit of all its buyers, all the people in procurement, and one of the very few people left at the end of the day was my brother. The rest lost their jobs. Because the little things, the little things, yes, they accepted the little things. And it led to bigger things and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. We don't know what we're doing when we're doing it. You know, sometimes we think we're just doing a little thing. Oh, what, it's just a little thing. What difference does it make? Obeying God in the small stuff, it's a foundation on which Christ, that relationship with Him, it's the foundation on which obeying Christ in the small stuff that He begins to, to give us the, the bigger things when we obey. And uh, you talk about small stuff, Jesus said, let your yes be yes. Is there anything smaller than a yes? And that our yes means yes, and our no means no. You know, we don't know what we're doing when we're doing it. It's not about fishing. It's about obeying. It's about obeying God in the small stuff. But that's not all. It's also, the second thing I want to talk about this morning, it's also about leaving room leaving room in the routine. Shortly after I graduated from seminary, I began to realize that you know, preaching every week was very different from preaching every once in a while. That Sunday comes around very regularly, and having something to say every week, well, I realized that I needed help. I got together with a group of friends of mine. We all needed the same help. So we we put our heads together and said, what do we do? Well, what we did was we asked a preaching professor, someone that we respected greatly, if he would help us. Well, the person we asked was Dr. Fred Craddock. He was in, listed in Newsweek magazine among the 15 greatest preachers in the English-speaking world. I went to his office, and I, I asked him if he would meet with us. And <laughs> you asked for something crazy, and guess what? He, he agreed to it once a month. For two years, he met with us to work on preaching. And at supper time, that was the best time. We weren't working on sermons then. Usually, we were just listening to his stories. 
And I remember he shared a story. He said that he went out to buy peanut butter. Now, he said that the grocery shopping was usually his wife's domain. And going into a grocery store, he was, he was like an alien in a foreign land. All he wanted was peanut butter. So he stopped to ask this, somebody who looked like they might know something about peanut butter where the peanut butter was. And he, this woman, he said, do you know where the peanut butter is? She said, she looked at him and she said, yeah, right. Well, he got to thinking, well, maybe it's a state secret here in these parts that you, you just can't get peanut butter when you want it. So he nosed around. Finally, he found the peanut butter. He reached for it, and when he pulled it off the aisle, that, the same woman that he had asked earlier came around the corner down that aisle, and he said, she said, oh, you really did want peanut butter. He said, well, that's what I said. Where's the peanut butter? She said, no, I thought you were just coming on to me. You never can be too careful. To which he responded, yes, you can. You really can be too careful. And sometimes we just, we just really are too careful. We're too careful managing, organizing, setting our goals, setting our list, making sure things are perfect, building what we want in the way that we want, being so careful that in our routine, we have no room left for anything other than what we want and what we desire. That this story tells us that it's while Simon Peter was washing his net that Jesus came to him. That it wasn't when he said, hey, let me go see if I can have a, a, a life-changing event with Jesus Christ and see what he can be up to. That, no, it was while he was doing something else. And again and again and again and again in Scripture that it was while Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem that he met ten leprous men and he healed them. That it was as he went to the synagogue official's house that a woman came and touched the fringe of his garment and she was healed. That as, as he was approaching Jerusalem, that blind Bartimaeus called out to him. And he was healed. That it's, that it's not about fishing. It's not even about washing our nets. It's not even about us at all. That it's we don't know what we're doing when we're doing it, so, so, so we've got to leave room, room, room in the routine for Jesus, for listening, for responding to Him, to responding to neighbor. Leave room in the routine. Well, the story, it doesn't end right there. Well, they caught this great catch of fish, and, and all their lives were changed, and everybody wound up healthy, wealthy, and wise. Eh, it's not that kind of story. That's not where it ended at all. They caught this huge catch of fish, and the response that Simon Peter gives is, depart, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Sinful. Not just, I have this little ink blot of sin in my life that I can't seem to wipe. No, sin full, full of sin. Well, to be honest with you, you know, St. Peter's saying I'm a sinful man, it, it, it bothers me a little bit. I'd rather my saints be a little more saintly. I'd rather him have said, you know, I've got just this tiny blot that I have a hard time. Can you help me with? But no, he said, I'm a sinful man, oh Lord. And that word for, for sin is hamartia in Greek, and it means to miss the mark. And, it, and he means he, he hadn't just missed the mark every once in a while. He misses the mark often and a lot. He turns to Jesus and he says, depart, which sounds like shoo or go away or get out of here. Now hear the good news. Jesus doesn't leave. Jesus doesn't leave. And there's the good news that day. Jesus doesn't leave, that sin doesn't disqualify you. Murder didn't disqualify Moses. Lying didn't disqualify Jacob. Adultery didn't disqualify David. 
Being an accessory to murder didn't disqualify Paul, and being sinful didn't disqualify Peter. Hear the good news that it doesn't disqualify you or me. That when Jesus gave his life on the cross, it was to take away your sin and mine. Whether it's just a smidgen and a block or you're full of it. If you miss the, the mark every day and often, Jesus died on the cross for you. To wipe away that sin. To throw it as far as the east is from the west. And now hear the really good news. That he rose on the third day to give power for you and for me that we might receive that forgiveness. You know, we most often don't know what we're doing while we're doing it. That um, it may be in the little things. That little things like putting a child to bed that you've gotten so caught up in your routine and making sure that you, you've gotten done what you, you need to do, that, that you've not left room for God. You've not left room to, to create a home. It may be that um, in this pandemic, that you found the best way to get through it is to get busy. And you've gotten busier and busier and noisier and noisier. And being able to, 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 to fill your life with all kinds of little distractions that you scarcely hear your husband or your wife or your neighbor. And you certainly don't hear from God. And that you've not, you've not left room. Not only have you not left room, that you haven't obeyed him in the small stuff. Hear the good news this morning. Jesus didn't just offer sins once for all a long time ago. He offers forgiveness of sins once for all today. And that invitation is to you. And I want to invite you to receive that forgiveness of sin by the the power of the risen Christ, who's here with us now, pray with me. Jesus, so often we get caught up in what we want, what we think we need, in controlling and managing, perfecting and building, that uh, we lose our way. Lord, thank you that our sin doesn't disqualify us. That the good news is, is that you don't, you don't go away even when that's what we would prefer. That the power of your grace, that it searches, it seeks, and it, it pursues us. Lord, grant that this morning... By the power of your grace, we receive your forgiveness. And that we begin to, to obey you in the small stuff, in the everyday things, in the little things. Because, Lord, we sure don't know what we're doing while we're doing it. Lord, we need your help. And sometimes it's the routine where we're able to to insulate our ears, insulate our heart, not hear you and not hear those around us. We need the power of the risen Christ to make us attentive, not just in that little time called worship, but in the routines of the day. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord, this, this day. We might not only leave room in the routine, but we might hear those words. Our sins have been forgiven. And know that what you did on the cross, that it's, it's enough. It's enough to, 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 to pull our sin out of us and cast it as far as the east is from the west. And this day, may it be marked by praise, marked by gratitude and thanksgiving. 
It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.